So hi everybody, this is Sasa Hub. I'm Giacomo and today I'm with Dominic D'Angelo. He's a CFA chartered. He works at O'Keefe Stevens Advisory. So Dominic, please introduce yourself and then we'll get into the content. Today we're going to talk about AirCap. Awesome, thanks Giacomo and hello everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Dominic D'Angelo. I'm the Director of Research at O'Keefe Stevens Advisory. We're in RIA located in Rochester, New York. And uh, today I'm going to discuss why we believe AirCap um, is a is an attractive invest investment. So just first before I get started, I just have to read a quick disclaimer. Um, clients of O'Keefe Stevens Advisory, we do own shares of AirCap. Uh, we may buy or sell at any point. Uh, this is not investment advice. It's for informational and educational purposes only. Please do your own due diligence and um, consult a financial advisor. So AirCap is the largest airplane lessor in the world with a fleet size of roughly 1,487 passenger airplanes at the end of 2023. And so we believe AirCap is an attractive investment due to the external issues that stem from the major um, aircraft OEMs and suppliers, which includes Boeing, Airbus, Pratt & Whitney, Spirit Aerosystems. And so these issues have led to aircraft supply shortages in the face of strong demand trends and, you know, in December of 2023 and Q4 2023, air travel demand is basically back to pre-COVID levels. However, the supply uh, of these uh, of airlines and, and aircraft is in a much different um, situation. And so in 2021, AirCap made a transformational acquisition, um, acquiring GE's EVA, aviation uh, leasing business, GCAS. And uh, recently, G GE divested the remaining shares um, of AirCap. The transaction was both debt and stock. And um, again, the GE sold the last uh, last shares of AirCap recently. And so, what does this what does this get to? It gets to when you have supply demand imbalances, it leads to the the supplier having, um, in this case, which is AirCap, um, pricing power for their for their airlines and for their aircraft. And so we expect leasing leasing rates to accelerate on the higher end um, over the next couple of years due to the supply demand imbalance. And in addition, AirCap enters into secondary transactions where they sell planes that are either coming up to the end of end of a lease or are already on a lease. And the margin at which they're selling them today is at a much higher rate than what they historically have done. And so with the higher profits in the in the greater margin on sales. We expect them to aggressively repurchase shares, which they have done so um, in the past. On top of all of this, AirCap trades at a very attractive valuation. Um, based on my estimates, I believe they trade around 8.3 times my 2024 estimate of earnings per share and around 90% uh, of my 2024 book value. And my 2024 target price of roughly $92 is based on a one times um, year end book value figure. So let's get into what AirCap does. It's a relatively easy business to understand. They purchase they purchase planes from Airbus and Boeing and lease them out to airlines. And so the question to ask is, you know, why do some airlines choose to purchase versus own um, an aircraft? And there's a few reasons. Uh, the first is it's far cheaper to lease a plane than it is to own a plane. Uh, owning a plane, you got to put down a deposit. You have, you know, anywhere from a $30 million um, spending to up to a hundred, hundred million plus, depending on the aircraft that you're looking to purchase. And then you have, you know, anywhere from a five to seven year lead time on when you can expect that airplane to get delivered to you. So instead of that, you can choose to lease a plane, which only requires a nominal upfront deposit. And then you have your ongoing monthly lease, um, lease expenses. So some some airlines simply just cannot afford that upfront deposit and then back end large spending bill or large large bill for the airline for the airplane. And so on top of this, you know, leasing an airplane will give you uh, will give airlines added flexibility. And so, for instance, if a if an airline wants to test out a new route, you know, instead of purchasing an airplane, they could go to a lessor, take on a lease for you know a few years. And test out that market, which does not require this massive up, upfront spending to to figure out whether or not a new route um, is going to work or not. And then the last part is it is the timeline again. 
when you cannot get a plane delivered to you until 2030, 2031, um, but you need the plane, you know, within the next few years, the lessor is typically going to be your best bet to get that plane. And so today, over half of today's aircraft are leased, and that comes from almost 0% starting in 1970. And we do not see this trend reversing anytime soon. We think the flexibility leasing a plane um, gives airlines um, is, is worth it. Um, so the lease structure is typically five to 10 years. Um, and at the end of Q4, aircaps average lease term was roughly 7.3 years. Um, under, under the lease terms, uh, the airline is required for the day-to-day -day maintenance um, and servicing of the equipment. And leases also have this interesting clause called hell or high water, which means regardless of whether the airline is using and flying the aircraft on lease, they are still responsible for um, the, the monthly lease payments. And so whether the plane is grounded or not, the airline is still required to make um, the monthly lease payments. Um, and so just looking at their revenue breakdown, Aircap generates you know, the bulk of their revenue from these basic basic leases, month-to-month -month rental payments, 82% um, in 2023, 8% came from maintenance, 7% came from gain on sales. And this gain on sale is basically all profit and stems from when Aircap sells um, a plane to a in a secondary transaction at a price higher than what the company is carrying the uh, carrying the asset on the on the on their books for and then the last three percent is just from other um other income looking at where they generate uh their revenue um roughly 34 percent comes from asia pacific 23 from europe uh 19 from the us in canada and then 12 percent from both latin america um in africa and the middle east so looking at the composition of air caps portfolio um, 62% of their planes um, are Airbus, 32% are Boeing. And if, if if you've ever listened to Angus Kelly, who's the CEO of Aircap Speak, uh, you'll, you'll learn pretty quick that he is not the biggest fan of the practices that have occurred at Boeing, you know, stemming back, you know, several, several years. Um, and so this higher weighting towards Airbus, given all the recent problems with Boeing, um, is certainly a positive moving forward. And so looking at the aircraft by generation, new technology aircraft are going to be your most fuel efficient, most aerodynamic, lowest emission planes. That is the the, the cream of the crop um, aircraft. And so currently 70% of the fleet um, is this newest generation um, technology aircraft. And the average age of this these aircrafts are about four and a half percent or is four and a half years. And they target 75% of the fleet to be this new technology at the end of um, 2024. And so the other 30% of the fleet is current technology, which is basically older technology, um, prior generation models. And what you want to see typically with, uh, with a lessor is this barbell approach where your new technology is on the younger age, um, on the younger age and the current technology. So your older generations is on the older, on the older side. The biggest risk is if you buy in an aircraft and a newer generation comes out, that is going to lower the value of all prior generations. And so if you can imagine, you know, you have a lot of younger current technology, the lease rates at which you can charge other airlines for is going to be a lot less because airlines are always looking for the most fuel efficient, most cost advantage airlines. And so they're never going to pay, pay more for older generation models that are more, more costly. And so just highlighting the, the GCAS acquisition, acquisition quickly, um, they paid about, Aircap paid about $30 billion dollars um, of which they paid one, 111 and a half million shares of Aircap. Um, at the time, they only had 128, so you can see that the equity issuance was substantial. They, pay, they paid $25 billion of cash, which was all funded by debt. And um, at the closing of the transaction, GE would be a 46% owner of Aircap shares. And so part of the transaction, Aircap acquired $34 billion of assets, which was comprised of, you know, basic air, aircraft, engines, helicopters, freighters. And what was a little interesting about the acquisition was Angus always um, didn't really like the helicopter or the freighter business, but part of the acquisition, they were getting into this business, which which was a little um, 
which was a little interesting. And so GE did this did this um, transaction because they were looking to deleverage their balance sheet, sort of more you know focus more core or focus on their core business, and the they never had an intention of holding on to these you know 112 million shares of Aircap. There was a there was a lockup period at the beginning of the transaction, and everybody knew the second that lockup ended, GE was going to be in the market every single day. Um, selling shares of Aircap. And so regardless of whether the business at Aircap is performing really well or not, uh, when you have that much selling pressure on the stock, it it really doesn't, it doesn't matter. And so that, that selling pressure basically kept a lid on the stock price um, over the past few years. And so, like I said um, earlier, GE sold their last remaining share of Aircap in November 2023. Um, in, in that brief period of time, since then, the stock has gone from $68 to $78. And so, getting into the crux of the thesis and why we believe Aircap is undervalued and underappreciated by the market, and it again all stems back to the, to the issues at the OEMs, Airbus, and Boeing. So, the chart on the left shows the commercial aircraft deliveries over the past nine years. Um, and it, as you can see, you know, from 2015 to 2018, you know, it gradually, they gradually produced more, uh, a few percentage more per year of, of airplanes. And then in the end of 2018, uh, the first of many issues for Boeing occurred when the 737 MAX was found to have a design flaw. Um, I think two planes crashed, resulted in a couple hundred million um, people losing their lives. And then this resulted in the grounding of the 737 MAX for two years. And then COVID happens in 2020. In 2020, demand for air travel falls off a cliff because of the stay-at-home orders. And then supply chains um, are in shambles. And even today, while most supply chains are normalized, and we've seen a lot of cases where supply is actually in, in excess of demand, the aerospace industry is in the exact opposite situation where demand is basically at pre-COVID levels. However, supply levels are still substantially below um, pre-COVID levels. And so I wanted to read a, a quote from uh, John Pluger. He's the CEO of Airlease. Um, this is from the Q4 2023 earnings call. And it says, Boeing and Airbus are practically sold out through the end of the decade, which means if you place an order today for a Boeing plane or an Airbus plane, you are not getting that plane delivered to you until probably 2030. And I'm going to guess more likely 2031 or 2032 based on today's uh, supply chain issues. Um, and then the CEO of Airbus recently said the supply chain is a world of bottlenecks at the moment. And we have as many situations as we have suppliers, which again, just all comes back to there are so many production issues that are occurring simultaneously in the aerospace industry. And again, this is all going to benefit Aircap because if there's no other way to get a plane other than going to a lessor in the near term, then Aircap is going to have the upper hand on the, the lease rates that they can charge going forward. And so in addition to the OEMs, Airbus and Boeing having, having issues, uh, one of the major engine suppliers is also having an issue. So RTX is Pratt & Whitney's parent company. Uh, Pratt & Whitney has 35% um, engine market share. And in July, 2023, they found this rare powder metal defect that could lead to the cracking of some engine components. And this called for the inspection of what they thought was gonna be just 200 engines. And now they expect to pull about 600 to 700 engines off of Airbus A320neos. And they expect these uh, to take a long period of time to, to go through the inspection timeline. They originally thought it was only gonna take 60 days. And today they now think it's gonna take about 300, 300 days per engine to get through the inspection. And so this is gonna result in an average of roughly 350 A320neos grounded between 2024 and 2026, shown on the right chart, and peak, peaking out at roughly 650 jets sitting idle in the first half of 2024. Again, this just points to more supply issues for the, um, for the aircraft market. And so if you're an airline that relies on A320neos or Pratt & Whitney engines, you know, this is an absolute disaster for you. You have flights that are supposed to be flown uh, 
but planes, but you don't have the planes um, to fly them. Um, so again, we think the combination of both the issues at Airbus and Boeing and now Pratt and Whitney, again, just puts Aircap in such an advantageous position. Um, Aircap owns um, 427 engines and represents roughly 7% of the book value of the company. And so where do we think this is going to start to to show up in Aircap's financials? And so uh, new aircraft are typically leased a few years prior to delivery. So for example, if you're expecting a plane to get delivered in 2024, you likely Aircap likely put that plane or negotiated the leases for that plane back in uh, 2021 and 2022. So that it was prior to these basically the supply demand imbalance really shifting, um, you know, still during that time, you still were worried about COVID. So the demand for air travel is not where it is um, today. And so the chart on the left shows um, the leasing revenue per aircraft. And we believe um, the, the change and in the increase in lease rates is going to dramatically increase, not in 2024, but likely in 2025 and 2026, because planes that are going to be delivered then and planes that come off lease, um, shortly, um, those new lease rates are going to come into effect um, in 2025, in 2026. And in addition, we believe the duration of this hard market um, is going to last probably longer than um, what I think the market is anticipating. And so, again, uh, another quote from the early CEO um, from the recent conference call was, you could see some very significant 10 to 15 percent increases in lease rates over the last period of time. So, for example, if in 2023 lease rates increase maybe one, two, three percent um, year over year, they're now saying lease rates are up 10 to 15 percent year over year, which is a dramatic increase. And then in addition to this, he said another profound statement that airplanes coming off lease, off their first lease, they are able to negotiate lease rates at higher rates than what the initial lease term was. Which if you think about, which if you think about that statement, when an aircraft is brand new, they should be able to charge the highest lease rate when they comes up for the second lease, um, it should be lower, the third lease, it would be even lower. Being able to charge a lease higher than the initial lease rate is, is, is insane. It, it's basically what we saw in sort of the used car market um, for at least in the US, where you know people that bought cars in 2017, 2018, 2019 were able to drive them for a few years, and then in 2021 were able to sell them back to a dealership at a price higher than what they initially purchased it for because there was basically no supply of cars, and that is precisely the exact scenario that I believe is um, occurring in the aircraft leasing market. And so while the leasing revenue side is not going to show up for another year where we are seeing this show up is in air caps uh, gain on sale margins so when air cap sells uh, a plane that's either on lease or coming off lease um, and they sell it for a value that's greater than what they're carrying it at they recognize a gain on sale historically if they've had a plane that's worth just call it a million dollars. They've been able to sell it at a 10% premium to carrying value. So $1.1 million. The margin that they're able to get today is almost twice that. Um, as you can see on the right hand chart, it's, you know, they've they've done some transactions that are 20, 30, 40% higher than what they're carrying the asset at. And what are they doing with that, with that cash? They're repurchasing, repurchasing shares. And so if you can sell a plane. That you're carrying at a dollar and you can sell it for a dollar 40, but then you can go back and you can buy your stock that's trading at a discount to that dollar. Maybe it's trading for 90 cents. That is such a value accretive transaction that you would do as many times as you can. And that's exactly what Aircap is, is doing. And the number of transactions we think they're going to do is going to continue um, to be higher than what they've historically done at higher than historical margins. Um, so building on that, again, they have been aggressive repurchasers of shares. The only time they have not uh, been buying back shares is basically after a major transaction that they've that they've done. So in 2013, I believe they 
bought, um, they made a significant acquisition of ILFC. Um, and then in 2021, they bought GCAS. So that's the reason, the reason they did not buy any shares back basically in 2021, in 2022 was because their sole focus post the GE acquisition was to delever um, the balance sheet to three times debt to equity or less. Um, based on my math today, they stand around 2.7 times and on their um, adjusted figures, they're around two and a half times. So basically all excess capital that that they generate is going to turn in uh, turn to share buybacks. In addition to that deleveraging, they're now also on positive outlook from S&P, S&P and Moody, Moody's, which could result in a, a credit upgrade, which is going to further reduce the um, interest expense that the company has. And so book value per share is the primary metric um, that I look at and it is basically what's going to track the stock over time. Um, so in Q122, they had book value per share of about $59.70. And at the end of Q4 2023, they had book value of almost $82 per share, which is a 17% um, compound annual growth rate. You do not need many years of that type of growth rate to substantially increase the value of the stock and the company. And so while I think 17.2 is on the higher end of what they'll do going forward, um, it at least puts into perspective the, you know, the, the power of the business model that they, that they have. And so one of the things that, you know, we look, we look at extensively is the management team of the company, because we are minority shareholders, we need to feel confident in who we are partnering with. And Angus Kelly is probably my top two, top three favorite CEO um, that I, that I listened to and uh, have interacted with in the past. Um, you know, his whole life has been centered around um, aircraft leasing. Uh, he's been the CEO of Aircap um, since 2011. Um, and one of the th other things that we look at is just how is a management team incentivized? And, you know, th this day and age, it seems like every management team is compensated based on some sort of adjusted figure. And when we see that Angus and the, the air cap management team is compensated based on gap EPS, which is not very fungible by any means, you know, it, it, it gives us confidence that he is going to act in the best interest of shareholders. Um, Angus owns about 2% of the company. And um, you know, when, when you're dealing with any levered entity, leverage accelerates outcomes and the management team that you are dealing with is going to have a significant impact on the performance of the business and the negative impacts of just one or two small errors, given the leverage of you know this business could have a substantial impact on the book value and the shareholders equity of the company. I go to bed every night not worrying about what Aircap and what Angus is doing. I have full confidence in his ability. And so I just wanted to read uh, you know, one of his quotes that just signifies everything that I just said. Um, and this was from, uh, I believe, the Deutsche Bank um, Finance and Leasing Conference um, last year. And he said, quote, I mean, the objective here is to create value for you. You are the people who pay me. And when he says you, he's saying to the Aircap shareholders. Mm -hmm. You are the people who put the money into the business. That's all I care about. I do not care less about Boeing and Airbus and shareholders. I care about you. That's all we care about. So I have full confidence that he will go to bat for any minority shareholder. And I've met him a few times and um, you can tell how genuine he cares about um, everybody he, uh, every shareholder that he um, interacts with. And so looking at you know the valuation, um, even if a company is ha, has great return metrics, you know the price you pay for the stock and the business is going to be one of the key drivers of the performance um, of your return performance over time. And so, um, based on my estimate, I think Aircap is going to end 2024 with a book value of around $92. And based on all of the supply demand imbalances, based on what they are doing in the secondary market, you know. I think trading at one times price to book value is not the most egregious thing by any means. I I think they should probably trade at a premium, but 
just for conservatism sake, you know, if they trade it one time here on book value, it's about a $92 book value or a $16 um, per share or 16% um, return from today's price. Um, upside could potentially come from if the secondary um, transactions occur at a greater rate than I'm expecting or at a higher margin, um, it could lead to more creative um, transactions and a greater acceleration and growth rate of book value. Um, at a 1.2 times book value, you would get around $120 per share, which would be a 50% return. In addition, Aircap had um, planes on lease to Russia during the Russia-Ukraine war, most of which they basically had to abandon and are now in um, basically like lawsuits or insurance claims to try and recover some of the value that was lost. Um, in 2023, they recovered roughly $1.2 billion um, of insurance recoveries. Almost all of that has just gone right back into share repurchases. And I think they still have, you know, just under $2 billion left um, that they could potentially recover. And again, if they if they recover any of that, that would just be upside to my base and bull case scenario. Um, the bear case would stem from, you know, a lack of secondary transactions and maybe um, a credit event at a at a customer, um, maybe a maybe a larger customer gives back a plane and Aircap is forced to um, turn around and release the plane. Anytime a plane is, you know, sat idle and not on a lease is is costly every day. Looking three years out, um, I think Aircap uh, can grow their book value to around one hundred eighteen dollars per share. Again, I think one times book price to book value is relatively conservative. We'll get you to a price target of one eighteen forty four, which would be about a fifty percent return or a fourteen and a half percent IRR. The interesting thing to note is that any uh, private market transaction involving lessors, excluding a lessor that was in financial distress, has almost always occurred at a multiple greater than book value. So when I look at Boha acquiring Avalon, it was done at 1.7 times book value. Mizuho acquiring Air Castle at 1.2 times. Gossok, SMBC, 1.2 times. Carlisle Fly, Fly was in a um, in a distressed position, which resulted in them having to sell um, at a price less than um, one times book value. All of these transactions, at least like Freedance, that Aircap should at least trade at a premium to book value. And when you think about the data that Aircap has, when you have almost 1,500 airplanes all around the world, there is going to be nobody that knows the day-to-day -day market fluctuations what the repair times for certain engines is or what certain lead times are for Boeing or Airbus planes. Nobody is going to have a better understanding of that than Aircap. And that platform and that data is definitely worth something. And so to sit here and think that Aircap currently trading at a discount to book value is the right thing, at least to us, seems it, it, it seems outrageous. Um, and especially if the supply demand balances uh, continue the trend that they're on now, um, you know, thinking air cap can't trade at 1.234 times book value, um, it, I, I don't think is a stretch by any means. And so everything I've talked about so far has been, you know, the market's great for them, but air cap and lessors, there's obviously some risks. And one of the, uh, one of the things I've noticed is that the air, airline and uh, the travel industry typically has these, you know, left tail risks. 9-11 occurs and um, the demand for air travel declines. COVID-19 occurs and basically air, air travel demand falls off a cliff. Everybody's forced to stay at home. And then for lessors and air caps specifically, the R Russia Ukraine war occurs and Rus and basically air cap has to uh, abandon all planes that they have in Russia and take a substantial write down. I think they uh, think they had three point one billion dollars of assets in Russia and basically had to write them write them all off. Um, I think they recovered twenty two and maybe a couple engines, but for the majority of them, they just basically had to abandon them because of the because of the sanctions. And so, moving forward, um, any new supply of aircraft is going to potentially affect the current um, the, the current value of Boeing or Airbus um, planes. And so China has always been trying to internally generate or internally manufacture um, their own um, own aircraft. Recently, they did successfully uh, fly 
uh, an, an aircraft that they manufactured themselves. Um, however, if you uh, if you read any any like news report about it, it's basically all foreign uh, parts that are just assembled in China that has Chinese paint on it. They really don't have the technical capabilities yet to internally manufacture their own aircraft. So while it's a relatively new and probably not an issue for the next couple of years, it's just something to monitor um, going forward. Uh, third, and maybe one of the most important parts is credit risk. So AirCap, um, who they lend to or who they lease to um, is, is very important. If you if they lease a plane to um, a, an airline that's in a lot of financial distress, you know there's always the chance that they have to um, return the plane, or maybe they go bankrupt, um, which could result in missed lease payments. Um, and again, aircap having to release uh, a plane um, in short order. And so, credit risk. One of the one of the main risks you have to think about is when when AirCap is a, or a lessor for that matter, is a small lessor, they can choose who they lease planes to. When you're AirCap and you have the largest uh, largest fleet size, it's no longer you can choose who you lease to. You basically have to lease to, to everyone and maybe you can wait or you know who you lease to on the margin you can change. But when your fleet size is 14, 1487, the flexibility you have and who you lease to is far less than what it is if you're a smaller lessor. And so when you have to lease to basically everybody, you know, the odds that you lease to a airline that is of worse credit quality um, than somebody you would typically lease to um, probably increases. And then the last part is the aircraft residual value. And this ties into um, basically the new technology um, when when an airline or when an air yeah when an aircraft comes off lease, um, you have to release the plane. And if you have new technology coming on online, you know the the lease rate at which you can get is going to be affected by um, that technology pipeline. And so, if if you have many planes that are relatively young, but has new technology coming online, so new advancements in technology come online. The, the value and the lease rates, again, that you're able to charge going forward is going to be substantially less because the cost to operate those older planes is going to be far more than what the new generation technology can occur or what the new generation technology, um, you know, costs. And so the, the residual value, typically air, aircrafts have, um, you know, they get parted out at the end, I believe 15% of the end of life value of, a, of an aircraft is in that residual value. Um, again, it, it's one of the most important things to understand is what is the composition of the technology in a, in a, in a lessor portfolio, um, and how, you know, how is that stack up against what the OEMs are doing on the, on the new technology front. Okay. Okay. Ooh, and so just in summary, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so in summary, um, we believe the production and supply chain issues at Boeing, Spirit Aerosystems, Airbus, Pratt & Whitney, you know, it's going to increase the demand for air caps, planes, engines, and this is going to result in higher lease rates going forward. You know, they have a long, long history of compounding book value at very attractive rates. They're going to basically use all excess capital from these higher lease rates from these secondary transactions into share repurchases, you know, selling planes for 1.2 times book value is a very attractive um, return on equity. And they have one of the best CEOs in Angus Kelly in the game. And just to illustrate the secondary transactions impact on book value and, and the return on equity it generates, if you can imagine um, Aircap has a carrying value of $40 million and they typically use some leverage. So call it $30, $30 million of debt on a plane, which would mean they have about $10 million of equity in, in the plane. Say they sell that plane, that $40 million plane for 1.2 times book value, which is precisely what they've done recently. So to calculate the return on equity, if we take the sale value minus the debt on the plane and divided by the equity in the plane, you get 48 million minus 30 million. So you get 18 million divided by the 10 million. It turns into a return on equity of 80%. When you can take that 80% return on equity and buy a stock again at a discount below book value, you know, you're you're basically 
the, the accretion to book value is over, you know, 85, 90, 90%. And so again, Aircap is going to continue to do that transaction as many times as they can, which is going to substantially grow book value at a, a higher rate than what um, what would otherwise be thought. So that is our um, investment thesis on Aircap. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. So I, I wanted to start off with understanding the, the possible downsides. So uh, in a case of, um, I don't know, you, you talked about the issues we had in Russia and so on. How much? You, do you have a understanding of how many cents on a dollar were they paid back by the insurance to understand the downside? If, for example, they they would have any other problem like this, for example, with China, how much of that could they could they risk? Yeah, so th they currently have lawsuits as well, but um, on average, it's been around sixty five to seventy cents of recoveries. So if they had a plane over there for that was $10 million. They typically in insurance recoveries have gotten around six and a half, seven million million. Um, but they are also going after other, um, you know, insurers, um, for that remaining, for that remaining value. Okay. So the, that, that Russia, Ukraine, I mean, I don't, I don't want to call it a, a one-off, but you know, that's such an exogenous, um, event to, you know, to worry about that going forward, you know, if you're worried about something like that, then your um, propensity to make a new investment, if you're that far down the risk um, spectrum, you, you know, you're probably not going to make many investments if that's sort of um, like the the risks you want to avoid. Because that's such a, in, in my view, it's such a one-off risk. Yeah, 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 I understand. And um, in a case of we've seen Boeing having a hard time, a few, a few crashes and so on, how is the expenses of that uh, divided between the airline, the the leasing company, the insurance, and so on, just to understand. Yeah. yeah. So the lessor has no responsibility on that since all the maintenance is required to be done by the airline. Um, it it aircap and the lessors have no um, have have no responsibility to that. It from there, it's then gonna come down to who was technically at fault for the crash. So if the airline is at fault, um, for I'll just say quick quick aside, like I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, we had a plane crash um, a couple decades ago and it was turned out that um, the pilots made the error. And so under that situation, the airline is gonna be responsible for any damages that occur. In the case of the 737 MAX that had a design flaw, it is, I, I believe it's almost entirely um, going to fall on Boeing to um, cover the damages of um, of the crash. Okay, 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 I understand. And um, are the orders that Aircap has made uh, mainly Airbus, Boeing, or they're basically 50-50 maybe with some em Embraer on top of yeah, it? Yeah, it, it's almost all Airbus, Boeing. I, I, I know they have their um, forward order book. I'm not sure what um it is I, I i suspect based on gus's uh his history it's probably leans more towards airbus um but i'm not 100 percent sure on what it um what the exact composition composition is Embraer doesn't really play much i know they have a little um subsection of planes from them but it's basically airbus Boeing. okay 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 and has the has the management ever mentioned the risk of collecting less from the the fees that that they receive for Boeing airplanes, in the case if they're considered less safe, maybe when they have to renew the contracts, they'll have le less of a bargaining chip compared to the Airbus airplanes. Is that possible? Yeah, I, yeah, I get what you're saying. So the with all the issues at at Boeing, are you know are our airlines going to be? Are, are they not going to pay as I have a rent to Aircap because of the issues? I'm going to say maybe, I'm going to say at least in today's demand environment where you can't get a plane, I'm guessing that is not something that's on there. I'm guessing that's not something that's happening. Um, if we were in a different situation where, you know, an airline had had their choice and could get an, an aircraft, a Boeing or Airbus aircraft in, in short order, I, I suspect that would be something. Um, to watch out for. With that said, 
you know, Boeing and, you know, one of Boeing's largest customers is Aircap. And so if Aircap went back to Boeing and said, hey, we're not able to get the lease rates we thought because of your design flaws or your issues, Boeing is probably going to cut the price that they charge for their future orders uh, down a little bit to to make sure Aircap is is happy and remains a remains a customer. Okay, 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 and yeah, and also I wanted also to mention one thing that it's a bit hard probably to understand about this sector of aviation because you have on one side the companies like Boeing, Airbus, and in, in this case Air that make a lot of money. On the other side, you have companies that struggle a lot like airplane um, airlines. And we've seen what happens, what happened with, for example, Spirit Airline, Airlines. Yep. In in a case like that, do leasing companies have a hard time collecting their fees or are they, um, they have some, some way to collect their fees anyway? Yeah, so typically if an airline defaults or stops paying lease rent, um, their lease rents, Aircap will go in and repossess the airplane. Um, or if the airline is in bankruptcy, they'll typically work with the the airline um, throughout the bankruptcy proceedings and potentially renegotiate lease rates. Um, in addition, you know, just like um, an apart, if you were ever rent an apartment, you have to put down a security deposit um, to you know, in case of damages, if an airline ever were to stop paying leases or um, would default on their lease payments, Aircap would then uh, collect that, you know, that security deposit. Um, so it it is one of the main risks to look out for. I would, again, under today's demand environment, when everybody is looking for a plane, honestly, if, if Spirit or some other um, airline were to default on their payments, I suspect the lease rate at which Aircap could then release those planes at is probably higher than what the current lease rate is on on those aircraft. Um, so, again, not something I worry about now as supply chains normalize and you know the foreseeable future that that'll be something to to watch. Okay, okay. My my last question is more about uh, the avi the aviation de um, services demand overall. So after the pandemic, we've seen that um, airplane uh, use and travel has grown a lot. Is it something that is going to stay? Because on one side, probably we have um, tourism that is up big time. On the other side, probably there's a let less there's a little bit less of business travel. Are these trends going to stay or is it just because people want to get out once they've had two bad years? Yeah. So I, I think um, if you think about the countries that are developing, whether it's like India, China, their middle class growing um, as a percent of their population is going to be a major tailwind for future air, um, air travel demand. Um, I, I agree with you on the, on the business side, the business travel side. Um, I also think over, over time, over the past, I want to say 50 years in general, air travel demand has grown at a two to 3% clip per year, you know, to something to, to say that that's probably going to materially change going forward. I, you know, I don't think um, that's the case, but you know, if, if people stop wanting to travel, obviously that would be a major headwind and would probably result in some credit events at, at airlines. Okay, but that's not very likely given the outlook you gave up you gave us. So. I, yeah, I, I don't think so. I again two to three percent growth per year. You got growing middle classes across across the world. Um I, I, I think as as the world becomes a richer place, you know, air travel demand is just gonna is gonna follow suit. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm done with the questions. Dominic, if you wanna add anything else, feel free to do so. If not, I really wanna thank you for your time for this presentation that was very clear and very easy to understand for those that are not in this sector full time, you know. Awesome. Thank you very much, Giacomo, for having me. And if anybody wants to reach out, discuss the name, um, you can find me on Twitter at OSA underscore Rochester or, or feel free to shoot me an email. OK, I'll put all the links in the description so it, it will be very easy to find.
And so this is it for today. I'm Giacomo. This is Hasafab. See you next time.